Um, I'm going a, a very sexy silver colour these Ooh. days in my hair, yeah. and uh, somebody suggested I should actually, um, you know, start treating that somehow, dyeing. And I'm not going to. I'm not going to do Gosh, that. Gosh, no! Don't no. do that. There's nothing nicer um, than a silverback. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I don't. No, um, Anya, I that's d- what you call men with on paper hair, darling. Oh, so I, I thought you were talking about the, the, hair, on the, the hair on my back no, that's going no. silver. No, I let's don't, not I, talk about the hair on your back. We're on the radio. We're well, the That's quite a visual, isn't it? <laughs> um, no, I, 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 I don't do anything. And um, the thought of uh, having somebody else's blood uh, put in me when it's not absolutely necessary for some uh, life-saving procedure or otherwise is. Um, mm. I, I, I don't. I find that um, just a little bit, a little bit too much. I know, but you can only imagine what sort of bilge my blood is now. I mean, I don't know how long the young person's blood is going to stay inside you, but wouldn't it be better than the toxic mix I'm carrying around? I'm sure well, I, th- I think idea. I think that's the point. I've, I've had a text from a chap oh, here. He says he says I'm 64. Uh, would 64? And I, I'm a 64 year old blood donor. Does this mean that my blood will make the recipient feel old? <laughs> and I, think, I think that is a very fair point. Right, we will pull I think discreet. the recipients of, um, of blood donors' blood are so poorly at the time they get yeah, it they that they really uh, feel fantastic. <laughs> yeah. but we'll, I, we'll I draw... think your blood recycles actually very, very quickly anyway, in a matter mm, of, uh, matter of days. So your, your toxic week? mix, your toxic, toxic mix, <laughs> if, you, if you look after yourself for a couple of days, you'll probably find it'll be quite rejuvenated. Well, it does ensure <laughs> that people news. will be going for $8,000 transfusions quite regularly, <laughs> doesn't it then? All right, we will draw a discreet veil across that conversation now. Freedom... Freedom Camping. Now, this has been an issue in, in Christchurch and around the South Island. You'll know about this Lisa to into Otago and towards oh, Queens, yeah, Queenstown. It's been so bad. So well, bad. Northland has bitten the bullet and they've actually come up with a new bylaw on that now and some sports fields and beaches and scenic reserves are off limits for Freedom Campers. They've just voted this in as part of a new council bylaw. Apparently Mm. there was an audible sigh of relief around the table, the council table, when they signed it off uh, yesterday to regulate Freedom Campers in Whangarei after a very long process. And what the Camping and Public Places bylaw covers is self-contained vehicles as well as non-self-contained campers. It comes into effect on the 21st of October and they're going to start to roll out the signs but there'll be a map online so that people can actually, you know, go on online and have a look uh, at where they can and can't park. Is this the way to go? What else might help people follow the rules, do you think, Lisa? Oh, it's just so sad, isn't it? I mean, I, I, my biggest problem with it is I love freedom camping and I think it's a New Zealand way and this is just the tragedy of the commons. Perhaps a tax on tourists as they enter New Zealand would help as well. It's the small places that suffer the most and they're the ones that need to get some money out of the tourists. They have to clean up after them. Yeah, but I, I think the problem we've found in Christchurch too is that you can have people who have got uh, vehicles without toilets on board parked next to public toilets and they'll still go and crap yeah, in a bush, it's you know. unbelievable, unbelievable. Yeah, sorry, there's no easier, cleaner way to say no, it. No, no, it's very, jo- very graphic. J- Jonathan, are we, <laughs> are we walking a fine line when we start banning things for tourists when we should be trying to accommodate them? I agree. I think that um, I mean, in, in Hawke's Bay, where I live, um, the... The Napier City Council has organised an area along Marine Parade, oh. just on the on the city boundary, it's gone. where it's gone. Oh, somebody's speaking. No, <laughs> somebody's squeaking in the background. Where um where, where freedom campers are able to uh, camp, there's a few parking areas, and I think the, the rule is two nights or something. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think there's a fee, but I I, I think it'd be a sensible idea to, um, to to have a fee for for campers that want to come and camp. I mean, in tourist areas mm. like ours, it's just really important that we accommodate tourists. Mm. Well, thank you both. Uh, Hope you enjoy your weekend. Jonathan Krebs in Auckland, Lisa Scott in Dunedin. News is next. Good everyone, tonight on Checkpoint, the county's Monaco DHB tells us it's offering what it's calling a voluntary cessation scheme. In other words, letting people leave their jobs and get a payout because of a projected $20 million deficit for the next financial year. The DHB's CEO, Gloria Johnson, joins us to discuss the pressures they are under. A court hears the children of a woman stabbed to death at a pamper party are so traumatised they sleep with weapons beside their beds. Team New Zealand reveals more protocol for the next America's Cup and evacuating Ambaya Islands in Vanuatu.
RNZ News at five. Kia ora, good afternoon. Ko Katrina Batten, aho. The Vanuatu government hopes to have most residents evacuated from Umbai Island in the next few days. An armada of boats is heading towards the island after the government made the call to evacuate 11,000 people threatened by the eruption of the island's Manaro Vui volcano. More than 7,000 people are already crammed into coastal evacuation centres as a thick layer of volcanic ash and acid rain blankets village, villages and crops. The Prime Minister, Charlotte Salwai, says two parcels of land on a nearby island are being made available for Ambai Islanders, but it's only a temporary solution. The government is asked to invest uh, some money to set up some uh, logistics, utilities and facilities in place. We are talking about 11,000 people, so the two places won't be enough to allocate uh, the whole population of Ambai. Charlotte Salwai hopes to have the island completely evacuated within a week by October the 6th. Meanwhile, the head of the provincial government on the island of Ambai says people are devastated at having to leave their homes. George Wingarai says islanders are used to the volcano, which is one of the world's most active, but he's never seen it erupt like it is now. He says people are devastated at what's going on, but safety is paramount. George Wingarai says no one knows when people will be able to return. The Department of Conservation has brought in the police to investigate several recent incidents of vehicle tampering connected to pest control operations. Wheel nuts have been loosened on vehicles used by dock workers or contractors in two different regions. And in the most serious case, a contractor's wheel came off while he was driving. Docks Director General Lou Sanson says it's lucky no one has been hurt by the vehicle tampering, which he believes was an attempt to intimidate workers involved with 1080 pest control. He's also seen posts on Facebook threatening to put wires across gullies to bring down helicopters and says several brochures depicting helicopters as targets have been left on dock vehicles. I'm feeling for our staff and contractors that live in rural New Zealand. We can understand the right to legitimate protest, but when it crosses the line to wheel nuts on vehicles or putting toxic baits in people's personal property, we think it's gone too far. Lou Sanson is urging anyone who sees people tampering with dock vehicles to contact the police. The family of an Auckland woman stabbed to death at a pamper party says they're struggling to come to terms with their loss. Mother of two, Carly Stewart, was murdered by her friend Anna Brown in October last year. Brown was today sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum non-parole period of 12 years. In her victim impact statement to the court, Ms Stewart's mother, Charlene, had a message for Brown. Shame on you, Anna Brown. How dare you murder our beautiful Carly. What did Carly do to deserve this? You gave Carly no chance to defend herself. Your actions on that day were calculating and thought out. Clearly, you knew what you were doing. Your intent was clear. Charlene Stewart says it will take her grandchildren years to feel happy and secure after their mother's death. She said they sleep with weapons beside their beds because they're scared. A recruitment agency is planning to import truck drivers from overseas because local young people aren't interested in that line of work. While the amount of freight carried by trucks has increased uh, over nearly, by nearly a quarter of the past, over the past 11 years to more than 23 billion tonnes, the number of drivers has dropped by more than 10%. It's led to the Can Staff Recruitment Agency to look overseas for drivers and in some cases pay for their flights and relocation costs. Can Staff's Managing Director Matt Jones says young people in New Zealand simply don't find the job appealing. It's probably not sexy enough for, for that generation. There's a bit of graft in it. There's a bit of dirt under the fingernails, that type of thing. The millennial generation uh, enjoy looking at a computer screen. Uh, they don't mind uh, driving a truck on a computer screen, but uh, doing it in, in real life is uh, a, a little bit different. Matt Jones. It's four and a half past five. Sport and defending champion Lydia Ko remains just off the leaderboard, nearing the end of her second round at the New Zealand Golf Open in Auckland. She's currently tied for 26th, six shots from the leader, Belen Motho of Spain. American Emily Tubert fired one of the rounds of the day to put herself in contention. Tubert's in her first year on the LPGA Tour and says she contemplated quitting golf until she found a new coach and caddy just last month. The last thing I wanted to do was be at a golf course practicing because it was so miserable. And there was just something inside that told me, not yet, 
and, and as hard as it was sometimes to suit up and show up and keep practicing because I felt like I was just aimlessly wandering, I did. And, and now I think I've finally found some direction. American golfer Emily Tubert. Team New Zealand is warning Auckland that it needs to get moving if it's to ensure the America's Cup regatta does not get shifted to another venue in 2021. Team New Zealand has confirmed that it plans to defend the Cup in Auckland in March 2021 using 75-foot monoholes. Chief Executive Grant Dalton says they and challenger of record Luna Rossa have agreed that Italy would be the backup venue if for some reason Auckland cannot host the Cup. The infrastructure needs to start by the middle of next year. Proper infrastructure, hard infrastructure, because by summer 2019, there will be boats and there will be teams. And we, right now, we've got nowhere to put them. Team New Zealand CEO Grant Dalton. That's the news. Tonight on Nights, something for all of you planning on hitting town later this evening, or who knows someone who is, a guide to nipping sexual violence in the pub or nightclub in the bud. Nipping it in the bud anywhere, really. Country life is the rundown on early spring growth. And because a few of our migratory birds are returning for the summer, we thought we'd dedicate our sonic tonic to the songs and sound bites of home on nights with me, you and the cows after the news at 7 on RNZ National. Met service weather now through to midnight tomorrow. Northland, occasional rain, easing to a few showers tomorrow morning. Auckland to Taranaki, including Coromandel Peninsula, Bay of Plenty and the Central High Country. Cloudy periods with the odd shower. Becoming fine tomorrow morning, but a few showers from afternoon, possibly heavy. Whanganui to Wellington, scattered showers, possibly heavy tomorrow afternoon, but Wellington City staying mostly dry. Gisborne to Hawke's Bay and also Nelson and Marlborough. Cloudy periods, a few showers from tomorrow afternoon, possibly heavy and thundery about the ranges. Canterbury, Otago and Southland, cloudy periods, a few showers about Otago and Southland, some possibly heavy, easing tonight. Showers returning to most places tomorrow afternoon, some possibly heavy. Buller to Fiordland, a few showers turning to rain in Fiordland and southern Westland tomorrow morning and for the Chatham Islands, periods of rain. At seven and a half past five, and you're listening to Checkpoint. Thanks, Katrina. Busy programme tonight. Coming up, a private school run by tax-exempt charity. Destiny Church applies for help from a charity. But we begin tonight with the CEO of the county's Monaco DHB, who this afternoon told us she is really concerned about the effects of workloads on DHB staff and therefore on patients. Dr. Gl Dr Gloria Johnson says they urgently need more staff and, quote, it isn't right people are being asked to work as hard as they've been asked to work this year. Now, this interview was in, in response to our revelation on Wednesday night that Counties Monaco was offering a voluntary cessation scheme to staff, including clinicians. Last night, we revealed that a New Zealand nurses organisation survey at the DHB had found that over 90% of nurses had experienced staff shortages that had on occasion impacted on their ability to care for patients. Dr Johnson is adamant any savings achieved by allowing staff to leave will only be spent on frontline care. They are redistributing resources, not reducing them. But why do they need to redistribute resources at all? Oh, if you mean are we short of funds? Yes, we are. We've certainly got to be able to figure out a way of being able to fund an expansion of our clinical workforce, and we're doing that at a time when we are actually in deficit. So that's challenging. How, mu how much are you in deficit? So we ended last year with a deficit of about $12.9 million. And your projections in your annual plan for this fiscal year, 17-18? $20 million deficit. Okay, so don't you need more money? In other words, if you weren't in the position of having a $20 million projected deficit for this fiscal year, would you be asking for voluntary redundancies? Well, first of all, we're not asking for redundancies. We're, it's a voluntary cessation scheme, and that is, that is actually a, quite an important distinction. Would um, you we're be, not looking to make Would you redundant. be running this scheme, this scheme. if you weren't we facing a $20 million deficit? We might well not have thought of it because it certainly came out of our thinking about what are all the kinds of things that we can do in order to try and ensure that we are, can free up some money in order to employ a bigger clinical workforce because that's clearly what we've got to do. So it is 
part of an of an overall major savings plan that we are developing. As a result uh, and, and of that savings, sorry. A, as a result of the fact that you are facing a twenty million dollar. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank yep. you. Thank you. Thank you for being so straight about that. I'm confused about your fiscal position. If I go back to the annual report 2016 uh, and I look very proudly at you citing with good cause your successful completion of Treasury requirements of all public sector mm. entities for an investor confidence rating, you say the CMDHB received an initial A rating, one of only two public entities to date to have achieved such. So I think, gosh, that's impressive. I go and look mm. at Treasury. February of this year, February of 2017, your rating is still A. What yep. has happened? Why do you need to find savings now when Treasury was affirming you as an A rating as recently as February? So there are two, two key issues in that. Um, the first and probably most important is the um, incredible ex escalation in acute demand that we've experienced that really became apparent about December last year when we started experiencing a major increase in demand for our acute surgical services in particular. And that just kept going. Surgical services are generally a bit busier over the summer because of trauma and stuff, but uh, we had a sustained increase in demand that's just gone on and on and on. And then on top of that, when we had the usual increase in, West, in medical demand, um, we were dealing with uh, levels of requirement for clinical services that were far greater than we had anticipated, despite the fact that we always plan year on year to have to meet increasing demand. But it has really been quite extraordinary. Don't you need more money? If, if, sorry, yes, it really, so, I interrupted so, the phrase, and it's a yep, really salient phrase. Yep. It really has been quite extraordinary this year. You used yes. the word acute demand. Don't yes. you need more money? So to meet that acute demand, yes, we, we will. And this is a problem for the whole of metropolitan Auckland, not just for counties. And we think the major driver of it is the increase in population in Auckland, um, which we, our funding, our pop, as you know, is population-based funding. There are two issues with that for us in counties Manukau. One is that we don't think that it does sufficiently take account of the rate at which the population in Auckland is growing. So we might get funding that, you know, um, the projections for the for the rate of growth for the rest of the country, of course, are quite different. And we need to have funding that takes account of how quickly Auckland is growing. So you are underfunded, aren't you? Oh, from our perspective, we are. The uh, other uh, issue sorry, that we no, have sorry, particularly... Sorry, no, yep. I really want to yep. drill down into that. Let's yep. set aside your perspective. Well, uh, on on, on a population basis, you begin yep. the financial year... Yep. with a population-based model, funding model, that yep. is obsolete by the end of the financial year because of the rapid increase in Auckland's population. That's one of the two factors. The other is... So that's that, an absolute no, hang on, flaw. I, it's that's an absolute flaw in your so, funding model, isn't it? John, I want to talk about the other flaw in the funding model to do with population. The other problem that we have is that the census is used as the basis for that population calculation. And the census numbers for South Auckland in particular are quite inaccurate. They are a serious undercount. And we know that. We know there are many more people here than get counted in the census because of our population mix. You know, high migrant population, a lot of people um, living in circumstances that, that they don't want anybody to know about. So there's a serious undercount of the population here. And you so, and so rather, than get, rather than get yeah. more money, you are facing a $20 million deficit mm -hmm. and you are asking for the voluntary cessation of employment agreements. I'm calling it redundancy. You're saying it's not redundancy. It feels, no. like me to this, feels like the same thing to me. In other words, you are having to cut costs and invite people to leave if they are so inclined because you don't have enough money to keep up with your growing population. That's right. We also have a lot of other things that we're having to do as part of our savings program as well, of course, looking at all of our programs of work, considering, you know, to what extent we might be doing things that are, um, you know, discretionary activities rather than core business. Uh, we do a lot of things that are still very useful things, but if they're not absolutely part of our core business, 
if we're this short of money, then we have to consider whether or not we really should be doing them. Now, you are asking if people would like to leave. We have a nurses survey which tells us very explicitly that 267 of the 272 nurses who answered have experienced short staffing in their ward or their team. In yeah. other words, you are doing it way tougher than you should be doing it because you don't have enough money. Yep, that's correct. I mean, we're really concerned about the effect of the workloads that we've been experiencing this year on our staff as well as on our patients and their families. And people have continued to do an absolutely fantastic job and we get amazingly positive feedback from people even when it's incredibly busy. But it isn't right that people are being asked to work as hard as they have been asked to work this year. We need to be able to get more staff in place and have more facilities in which to treat people um, really quite urgently now. And so that's why we, we, we actually need more nurses and more doctors and more physios and so on and so forth. We need more people who can actually directly look after sick people. And if we look at the impact of, of that first question in the survey that I mentioned to you, have you experienced short staffing lately? If we go to the second question, do you ever feel that you've reached the limits of safe practice as a result of an acute staffing shortage? 264 responses, 246 were yes. Yes, yeah, yeah. It's very concerning. Um, and we did a similar survey with our um, medical staff in the general medical teams as well. And, um, and they came up with very similar answers and gave us very similar examples of just how difficult it had been to continue doing a good job, uh, particularly over our very busy weeks in June and so, July so and the, early August. Right, so this is a County's Monaco DHB survey, so you've done your own internal survey. We did our own internal survey and, of the and, medical and, staff right. after, after the NZNO had shared their survey of the nursing staff, and, and which obviously greatly so, concerned us. Okay, yeah. and so your internal survey, more or less, in broad terms, matches the feedback that you're getting from the union? Yep, that's right, yep. So managers and unions agree that actually you are short-staffed? Yes, yes. A and, and we're not and just short, we're short-staffed and we're short of facilities as well. We, we ran into an enormous problem with, with being over full during the winter as well. So we urgently need more facilities too. And capital expenditure is also a problem in DHBs in this country that we've, we've almost disincentivised to spend on facilities. And we don't actually spend a lot of money on facilities, which is why you'll find a lot of hospice, hospital facilities are in relatively poor condition. Uh, and it is quite difficult for us to be able to actually um, continue to expand and get new facilities because of the impact that that has on our budgets. And do, did your internal survey echo what the Nurses' Union survey explicitly says, that there are staff, 246 of 264 respondents, who feel that they have reached the limits of safe practice as a result of an acute staffing shortage? Yes, yeah, so our survey was, we used, the, we used the same questions reworked for medical staff, and the medical staff expressed the same views as the nursing staff. What, yeah. that they've reached the limits of safe practice? Yes, yes, and that they were really concerned about the impact, the potential impact on patient care. And what people tell us is, you know, they, they still um, obviously practice as safely as they possibly can, but, um, but it's really stressful not only working really hard, but being aware of the fact that that may be having an impact on the quality of the job that you're doing as well. That's Dr Gloria Johnson, the CEO of the County's Monaco DHB in Auckland, of course. That interview and our revelations about the DHB earlier this week follow admissions from the southern DHB on checkpoint that unreasonably long delays in patient care have contributed to reduced life expectancy in patients with prostate cancer. Last month, Checkpoint reported on an internal paper from Capital and Coast Health prepared for the board and endorsed by its CEO that said, and I quote, the DHB is facing significant financial pressures. Also last month, a board member from the Waikato DHB told us on Checkpoint, and I quote, the reality is our staff are being told to find savings they just can't possibly achieve, which puts, 
which puts pressure on them. In July, the Canterbury DHB expressed concerns that reducing its deficit would require making service cuts of an unprecedented scale. And then today, what you've just heard from Counties Monaco. They are recurring themes from DHBs throughout the country. We asked the Health Minister, Jonathan Coleman, for an interview today. We obviously wanted to discuss what Dr Johnson has told us in that interview you've just heard and the similarities to what we've heard from other DHBs. His office replied, and I quote, staffing is operational and handled on the ground and, quote, it's also the government caretaker period and it wouldn't be appropriate for the Minister to comment. It's 20 minutes past five. You are listening to Checkpoint on RNZ. Coming up next on the programme, Destiny Church School applies for charity from the Kids Can Charity and former Green MPs rubbishing the prospect of the party doing any deal with National. We will hear that shortly. We'd love your feedback. You can text us on 21. You can email us, checkpoint at radionz.co.nz and we are, of course, on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for being with us. The children of a woman who was stabbed to death at a pamper party is so traumatised they sleep with weapons beside their beds. Their grandmother has revealed in court today. Mother of two, Carly Stewart, was murdered by her friend, Anna Brown, in October of last year at what was supposed to be a fun afternoon with friends that took a really ugly turn, obviously. And in the High Court in Auckland today, she was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum non-parole period of 12 years. Our reporter, Sarah Robson, was in court. In court today, Carly Stewart's mother, Charlene Stewart, turned to face her daughter's killer to give her a simple message. Shame on you, Anna Brown. How dare you murder our beautiful Carly. What did Carly do to deserve this? You gave Carly no chance to defend herself. Your actions on that day were calculating and thought out. Clearly, you knew what you were doing. Your intent was clear. Carly Stewart was stabbed once in the head with a large kitchen knife by her friend Anna Brown. She died after losing massive amounts of blood from an 11 centimetre stab wound. In her victim impact statement to the court, Charlene Stewart said her daughter was a loving, kind mum to two young boys. She said like the rest of the family, her grandsons are struggling to come to terms with what happened and now sleep with weapons beside their beds. Just in case... Someone does the same to them as their beautiful mum, Carly. It will take years for them to feel safe and secure again. The court was told that the two women had been at a pamper party that was meant to be a chance for a group of friends to catch up, have a few drinks and get their nails done. But Brown and Ms Stewart got into an argument. Justice Wiley said while Ms Stewart had decided to be the bigger person and walk away from the fight, Brown couldn't let it go. She went into the kitchen to get the knife. You were holding the knife in one of your hands. It was concealed from anybody in front of you. You walked towards Miss Stewart, who muttered her name once. She stood up from the couch she was sitting on and turned towards you. You walked up to her and stabbed her in the side of her head with a knife with an overarm downwards type motion. Brown then left the room, put the knife in the kitchen sink, picked up her handbag and left the party. Justice Wiley said a number of people, including four children, saw what happened. Their exposure to such serious and wanton violence will have a significant effect on them for the rest of their lives. It was also revealed in court today that Brown has a lengthy criminal record, mostly for dishonesty. But in 1995, she was charged in the youth court with attempted murder. The charge was later downgraded and Brown pleaded guilty to wounding with intent to cause grievous bodily harm. Then, in 2004, she was convicted of wounding with intent to cause grievous bodily harm over an incident involving a machete in which she was the getaway driver. Mō te hōtaka o te ahi ahi, ko Sarah Robson, aho. Staying in Auckland, a private school run by tax-exempt charity Destiny Church has applied for charitable help to feed and clothe some of its students. Destiny School is on the waiting list for help from Kids Can, which is also a charity because around 20 children a day are in urgent need. And that's despite the church's founders, Brian and Hannah Tamaki, driving luxurious sports cars with hundreds of thousands of dollars in total. Zach Fleming has more. A two-year-old Mercedes sports car parked outside a school where children are in need. Destiny Church's private school has applied for help from Kids Can. The charity helps low decile schools in hardship, providing food, shoes and raincoats. It also provides nip busters and orchard and schools programs. Destiny is one of 34 new schools currently listed on Kids Can's waiting list, seeking urgent support. 
The Mercedes sports car sitting outside the private school today with number plate Proton was reportedly bought for $75,000 last year by Destiny Church's co-leader Hannah Tamaki. Ms Tamaki currently owns a $200,000 Mercedes SUV she purchased last month. We went to the school today to see if anyone would speak to us. Principal Emily Tukapua referred us to the school and church's media manager, Anne Williamson. Ms Williamson said nobody would be interviewed. She did, though, confirm that the school applied for Kids Can Help around about two months ago for, quote, help with a handful of the school's 200 or so students. She also added that she's not confident the school will actually get Kids Can Help because of its affiliation with Destiny Church. But Kids Can CEO Julie Chapman says it's irrelevant who owns or runs Destiny School. They'll help wherever there are kids in need. They are on our waiting list and will be taken off um, once funds become available. Ms Chapman says the school has told her there are around 20 children a day needing support. Primarily children with scholarships or who are sponsored to be there. So they don't pay the private tuition, which Checkpoint understands can be up to $3,000 a year per child. Um, in terms of my opinion on the expense of cars and things like that, um, yeah, I, I think it's surprising. Um, doesn't sit that well with me, um, but at the end of the day, my priority is about helping children. I didn't take a camera inside Destiny School today, and at no point was I asked to leave. In fact, the church's media manager, Anne Williamson, didn't express any concerns when I met with her in her office. She said she would email me a statement answering my questions about the school's finances, but later emailed refusing to answer those questions, instead saying she would be referring the matter to the church's legal team. The church, which is tax exempt because it's a charity, is being investigated for serial late filing of its accounts by the charity's register. If it doesn't file by next week, the church will be issued a notice of intention to remove its charity status. Destiny School is third from the bottom on Kids Can's 34 school waiting list. For Checkpoint, Zach Fleming. Former Green MPs are rubbishing the prospect of their party doing any deal with National chalking up such talk as mere mischief making. The possibility of the two parties forming a coalition government has long been floated, although it has to be said seldom by anyone connected with the Greens. And National's deputy, Paula Bennett, again raised the notion this morning. But, as our political reporter Craig McCulloch reports, the idea does look dead in the water. It's a debate that rears its head every electoral cycle. Could the Greens ever mix with blue? Are you talking to the Greens? Not at this stage, no. I'm Do you saying, think you will? I don't know. I mean, we quite like to talk to them. So Nationals um, Deputy like Paula well, Bennett on the well, AM show this morning, reigniting the debate. Are petitions also circulating, asking both parties to put their differences aside? So far, it's garnered more than 8,000 signatures. The Greens co-leader James Shaw all but ruled out the idea the day after the election, but said he would hear National out if they gave him a call. It's my responsibility to do so, and we'll have to see what they've got to say. I mean, if that sounds non-committal, that's because it is. You know, Sources in the Green Party say there's zero chance of a deal with National. Members would consider it a broken promise of the highest order. One said just raising the prospect could end Mr Shaw's leadership. The Greens' rulebook requires their members to sign off on any coalition deal. They need the backing of at least three quarters of those at a special general meeting. They will decide, and I'm pretty sure what they're going to decide. The former Green MP, Catherine Delahunty, says she'd rather drink hemlock than back a deal with National. As far as I'm concerned, there's a snowball in hell chance the Green Party would ever be part of that. We fought hard to change the government, and the last thing I want to see is the Green Party or any other party propping them up to put them back into power because they've done enough damage. Another putting in the boot is Stefan Browning. He stepped down from the party at the election and says National's principles are anathema to the Greens. The National Party lied about Labor's fiscal intentions. That is dirty politics. It's got dirty results. National is full of it. The party's survival is present in everyone's mind too. David Clendon walked out on the Greens over Materia Two Days benefit scandal. The ensuing furore and Jacinda Ardern taking the helm of Labour saw the Greens skirting close to the crucial 5% threshold in the polls. 
Mr Clendon says everyone's aware of the fate of the Māori Party, which voters ejected from Parliament after its deal with National. If you're going into a coalition with a somewhat incompatible partner, you better do that from a position of strength. And I just don't think that the Greens, with seven or eight MPs, would have that level of security. Long term, David Clendon hopes the Greens can unshackle themselves to go either with left or right-leaning parties, but says at the moment National's policies are too incompatible. The very idea is mischievous, he says. National is just trying to strengthen its hand in negotiations with New Zealand First. There's a little bit of politicking going on, as I say, a little bit of uh, mischief-making perhaps, but I don't think anybody is presenting it as a feasible or a credible alternative. And Catherine Delahunty agrees. This is just a whole lot of political manoeuvring by the National Party and others who would like to give Winston something to worry about. It's pretty ridiculous, but I guess people are going to talk about something while they wait. The last word on the matter can go to former Green MP Mojo Mathers, who fired off a tweet this morning after Mrs Bennett's interview. National love the Greens now, do they, it said. Pity they couldn't show some love for the environment over the last nine years. From Parliament for Checkpoint, Craig McCulloch. Feedback already coming in on this early in Waitariri Beach, says the Green Party must, capital letters, consider going with National. 21 years in the political wilderness, 21 years being ineffectual, 21 years of worsening environmental standards. And who do they blame? The government. They need to take a long, hard look at themselves if they ever hope to be able to create meaningful, effective change now capital letters instead of in three years time be pragmatic act in the national interest swallow your pride and shut capital letter winston capital letter out says ali in waitariri beach thank you for your feedback it is 29 minutes to six Coming up on the programme, 10 New Zealand reveals more of its protocols for the next America's Cup. The evacuation of 11,000 residents from an island in Vanuatu. Vanuatu. Nona has uh, the week reviewed in business news. We got that. And uh, Katrina has headlights, first of all. I do. The Vanuatu government hopes to have most residents evacuated from Umbai Island in the next few days. An armada of boats is heading towards the island after the government made the call to evacuate 11,000 people threatened by the eruption of the island's Manaro Vui volcano. More than 7,000 people are crammed into coastal evacuation centres as volcanic ash and acid rain blankets villages and crops. The police are trying to find out who's responsible for tampering with vehicles used by Department of Conservation staff and contractors. The department says wheel nuts have been loosened on vehicles and in the most serious case, a dock contractor's wheel came off while he was driving. The CEO of the county's Monaco DHB has admitted she's really concerned about the impact of staffing shortages on staff and therefore on patient care. Gloria Johnson says the DHB is redistributing resources, not reducing them, with its offer of a voluntary cessation uh, scheme for staff, including clinicians who want to consider leaving their jobs. The Southern District Health Board is considering scheduling prostate can uh, surgery on the weekends to treat a backlog of patients in the urology department. Information released under the Official Information Act shows a wait time of 191 days for prostate cancer patients, the longest in the country. The DHB says 87 people urgently need prostate biopsies. The police hope to decide whether criminal charges can be laid over the collapse of the CTV building by Christmas. The building collapsed in the Christchurch earthquake of February 2011, killing 115 people. The family of an Auckland woman stabbed to death at a pamper party say they're struggling to come to terms with their loss. Mother of two, Carly Stewart, was stabbed to death by her friend, Anna Brown, who was today given life imprisonment. Mrs. Miss Stewart's mother, Charlene, says her grandchildren sleep with weapons beside their beds because they're scared. Those are the headlines. I'm back at six. Thank you very much indeed, Katrina. Let's turn to business news now with Nona Peltier. Hi, Nona. Building consents have had the strongest monthly gain since February, while the annual number of consents is around 13-year highs. Yeah, I so know. It's, it's incredible. It, you would, but you're not really, in a way, we kind of have to expect that we're going to be building a lot of properties. But because the, the answer to the housing crisis, is, we keep being told, is on the supply side, right? Absolutely. That's really the only answer. You've got a huge pent-up demand. So, uh, yeah, the, so the numbers surged 10.2%. Uh, that's a seasonally adjusted number in August over the month earlier, and it was the strongest gain since February. And what's interesting is that the surge has been really in those multifamily dwellings. 
and most of it has been in Auckland, mm. so which is what we'd expect to hear. Uh, housing actually dipped around the country other than in Auckland, so almost all of the big increase was Auckland, and um, you would expect that. Now, uh, ANZ uh, Bank, the economists there, have looked at those numbers, and they're saying, well, it's not exactly a trend, and um, they think that the housing uh, consents will be capped around 30,000 because that's our capacity level at this stage. So probably the most we can hope to build is about 30,000 properties or you know, homes a, a year. In Auckland? Uh, actually, I think that's a national number. Yeah. Yeah. And that's way short of what it's estimated it's as required. It's short of what's needed, yeah. Okay, okay. So uh, you would expect this to, to be a, a continuing issue, that there are going to be supply issues in Auckland. However, at least, hey, we are building houses and we need them, so that's good. Fisher and Paykel has won a small battle in defending intellectual property. Can you explain that to us? What was that case uh, well, about, Nona? you know, Fisher and Paykel have a, a fairly large competitor in the United States called ResMed, and they have similar products. But there are issues between the patents between the two companies. Fisher and Paykel say, you know, this is ours, and Resmed says, no, it's ours. Anyways, they've been fighting in various jurisdictions around the world. Uh, they just won, Fisher and Paykel just won a small little um, skirmish, I guess you could call it, because it's a big battle. Uh, in Germany, a German court suspended two of ResMed's claims uh, for alleged patent infringements, but never mind, uh, you know, ResMed's going to keep coming back at them. In fact, Fisher & Paykel has uh, spent close to $21 million in the year ended June on legal fees. Wow. And they think it's worth it because, I mean, you know, that's their whole gig. Is... I bet the lawyers think it's worth it too now. <laughs> $21 million. <laughs> wow. nice and, I, you know, that's just on it. one side yeah, of it, right? So yeah. you can imagine it's a lot of money. Uh, so anyways, but nevertheless, Fisher & Paykel's health care share price rose 1%. Um, so obviously the market liked that. $0.13 cents to $12.78. And our dollar, it's steady at 72.1 US, 91.9 Australian and 53.8 pence and that's despite a very strong rise in the US dollar over the course of the week. Um, shares in Asia have come off a little bit but not in our market. No, no, uh, we rose 0.2 percent to a record close for the week up 17 points to 7,930. Nona Peltier ending the week in business on RNZ. Thank you very much indeed. Have a wonderful weekend, Nona. Thank you. Thank you. Team New Zealand unveiled more details today of its 2021 America's Cup defence and given Auckland and the government a bit of a nudge to sort out the venue. The 37th Cup regatta will be sailed in 75-foot mono holes. The cat's gone, of course, probably with foils. And teams will be required to have at least three crew members from their home country. It's not a high bar, but it is a bar. Some details remain a mystery for now, though. Here's our America's Cup reporter, Todd Nile. A year ago, I didn't know whether I'd be walking in here with this to do this today. Uh, and, Team and New Zealand Chief out. Executive Grant Dalton laying out the rules for the next America's Cup. A 75-foot monohull, a three-sailor citizenship rule and residency requirements for the rest of the sailors. Also, the unprecedented naming of a backup venue in Italy, should for any reason Auckland be unable to host the contest for the world's oldest sporting trophy. Grant Dalton insisted it wasn't a warning shot to the Auckland Council and Government to get on with venue building. Now we've had an election, the Government will firm up, we can really get into it. Panuku have been great, uh, Council, Stephen Town and, and AT have been great. So it's starting to form, but it's still got to form. I mean, we haven't even worked on a host city agreement yet. We've been focused on the protocol and now that's done. Now the next stage. But a gentle nudge it was, and on hand to be reassuring, Ian Cossa from the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment. As Grant said, the infrastructure isn't immediately available um, in the harbour now. Uh, so some investment is going to be necessary. That investment will have a lead or lag time just to build it. Whatever it might be, we're working through a range of options, but we're very conscious of, of the end dates of when we need that to be there. Steve Armitage from the Auckland Council's event agency, AET, says papers on the base options should be completed in about a month to be ready for teams in 2019. There's a lot of work that needs to happen to make that 2019 deadline, um, but we're confident we can do that. Some rules are less draconian than speculated, such as whether New Zealand boat builders could seek business with foreign teams. Apart from the hulls, everything can be built in this country. The rig, the deck, the in internals, if necessary, everything. 
other than the hull itself. So that's a huge scope open still to the industry. It's not yet known whether the new boats will have traditional sails or solid wings, and the pedal-powered hydraulics used by Team New Zealand to secure the old mug in Bermuda are still allowed. Team New Zealand's winning helmsman Peter Burling is about to contest the Volvo Round the World race and was giving little away on the boat. Now we're really excited about you know some of the ideas we have come up with. You know this team's been incredibly innovative over the last eight years in, in multi hulls, and no, I think uh, we're looking to now bring that innovation into into some mono hulls. But the skipper Glenn Ashby was looser lipped on the question of foils. Well, there'll be foils of some description for sure. Um, uh, without foils, you, you know the boats don't sail too well. So. Yeah, look, there's going to be a lot of a lot of um, you know, development going forward, and you know there'll be a lot of work done over the next few weeks, few months on on what those boats will be. But one thing's for sure, the the sailing will be absolutely fantastic, and no matter what your background is, um, it'll be fantastic for yachting going forward. Beh, abbiamo deciso di um, di sostenere il nuovo corso. The challengers will race for the Prada Cup, sponsored by Luna Ross's main sponsor. The team's senior sailor, Max Serena, confident the regatta has a winning combination. Again, there is a lot of work to do, but I think uh, there is two solid uh, foundations behind this America's Cup. One is Team New Zealand, one is Luna Rossa and Prada, and, uh, and I think those two brands are going to guarantee the future of the next Cup. Entries open in January. The boat design rules will be published next March, and while there will be unspecified build-up regattas, a pre-Christmas race in Auckland in 2020 will be the curtain raiser for the main event at the start of 2021. A Christchurch recruitment firm has gone international in its search for more truck drivers. The truck freight industry is transporting more goods than ever, but finding drivers to man or woman those vehicles is proving a really tough task. Emile Donovan reports. Simon Reid owns a trucking company in Northland. It maintains about nine trucks and business is pretty good, but he's got a problem, one that's been building for some years and that isn't going away. There is a quite a problem with attracting drivers to the industry. It's not going to be something that goes away simply because the government isn't interested in helping us. They don't see it as, as being a critical problem in the bigger picture of the economy. Since 2006, the amount of freight trucked around New Zealand's roads has grown by more than 20% to over 23 billion tonnes. But in that same time, the number of truck drivers has shrunk by nearly 13%. Companies say it's because young people aren't showing any interest in the work, and the managing director of recruitment firm CanStaff, Matt Jones, reckons he knows why. It's probably not sexy enough for, for that generation. There's a bit of graft in it. There's a bit of dirt under the fingernails, that type of thing. The millennial generation uh, enjoy looking at a computer screen. Uh, they don't mind uh, driving a truck on a computer screen, but uh, doing it in, in real life is uh, a, a little bit different. So, in lieu of Kiwis, Mr Jones is taking matters into his own hands, travelling over to Ireland to pitch the job to youngsters from the Emerald Isle. We've got uh, 90 to 100 roles there at the moment to fill, and, and we just can't fill them within New Zealand. We're looking for people to come down and, and experience New Zealand, enjoy working in New Zealand, uh, and, and Ireland certainly uh, mirrors New Zealand on that front. Truck driving's actually a fairly lucrative job. It starts at about 50000 a year, hits six figures at the top levels and doesn't require an expensive tertiary degree. All you need to get the wheels rolling is a full driver's licence and one of four types of special class licence, which you can sit straight away after having your full licence for six months. The Toi Ohomai Institute of Technology in Tauranga offers courses in heavy truck driving safety. The group leader of those courses, Dean Colville, says enrolments have hit a low point. This year we've, we've had the lowest numbers ever of people coming through. Well, normally we, we run classes of about 20 and this year they've been down to 14 or as low as 6 in some cases. Mr Colville says the problem is the six month wait to get a full driver's licence, which means young people set on a truck driving career can't go straight from high school. And Matt Jones agrees that, despite his Irish solution, the wider issue needs to be addressed fast. The people that we're targeting are, in many ways, short-term solutions to this problem. Their ability to remain in New Zealand long-term 
uh, are very, very limited. So the people we bring in are, are a short-term gap filler. The, the, the whole industry needs more support. Mr Jones reckons overall there are about a 1,000 truck driving vacancies nationwide, just in case you're looking for a change of scenery. Mō te hōtaka o te ahi ahi ko Emil Donovan tene. 60 minutes to 6, feedback coming in on Destiny Church being on the Kids Can waiting list. What a cheek Destiny Church has. First they take a tithe of a tenth of family income, charge for children to go to their school and now want to take money from Kids Can, money that could help children really in need. Thank you for your feedback. You can text us 2101, of course, and email checkpoint at radioNZ.co.nz. The UN is being accused of a series of failures in the lead up to the Rohingya crisis. More than half a million Rohingya Muslims have fled an offensive by the Myanmar military in Rakhine state and are now sheltering in camps across the border in Bangladesh. Of course, we've been to those camps and the conditions there are really tough. Earlier today, the UN Security Council held its first open session on the crisis. Secretary General says violence in Myanmar has spiralled into the world's fastest developing refugee emergency and a human rights nightmare. But an investigation by the BBC's Jonah Fisher raises questions about the way UN leadership in Myanmar handled the issue. In the month since Rohingya Muslims first began fleeing into Bangladesh, the United Nations has been at the forefront of the response. Delivering aid and making robust statements condemning the Burmese authorities. The situation remains or seems a textbook, uh, textbook example of ethnic cleansing. But could and should the UN have done more before the killing and burning started? Really disturbing to think that some of this could possibly have been prevented. Caroline van der Nabila is a lawyer and aid worker, and between 2013 and 2015, she ran the office of the top United Nations official in Myanmar. Renata de Salian, a Canadian, it was a stressful time. Miss van der Nabila says her boss was so afraid of upsetting the Burmese government that any suggestion that they stand up for the Rohingya's human rights was off limits, even in internal meetings. Well, you could do it, but it had consequences. And it had negative consequences. It had consequences that you were maybe no longer invited to meetings, or it had consequences that your travel authorizations were not cleared. An atmosphere was created that talking about these issues was simply, was simply not on. Ms. van der Nabila says she repeatedly warned her boss about the possibility of Rohingya ethnic cleansing. But she was labelled an alarmist and a troublemaker and frozen out of her job. Her comments have been confirmed off the record by other senior UN staff. Thomas Quintana was for six years the UN's special rapporteur for human rights in Myanmar. Both Muslim and Buddhist Rakhine... He told me via Skype from Argentina that Mr. Salian tried to stop him covering Rohingya issues when he visited and asked him not to go to northern Rakhine state. The UN is aware that it does have a problem. A report commissioned by the UN two years ago and leaked to the BBC says the UN focused too heavily on the oversimplified hope that development investment itself will reduce tensions. A memo prepared earlier this year for the new Secretary General called the UN in Myanmar glaringly dysfunctional. Could the United Nations have stopped this Burmese army offensive? The answer is almost certainly no. But things just might have been different if there had been a coherent strategy over the last few years demanding that the Rohingyas' basic rights be respected and making aid to other communities conditional on the Rohingyas being treated better. After those damaging internal reports, the UN announced in June that Ms. De Salian would leave her job. But Myanmar seems to quite like her and has blocked her replacement. So she's still here. She is fair and she is not biased. So whoever is biased towards the Rohingya won't like her. Ms. De Salian declined to be interviewed, but in a statement, her office said, we strongly disagree with the accusations that the resident coordinator prevented internal discussions and stressed that she had the backing of the UN Secretary General. In the last month, half a million Rohingya have fled Myanmar into Bangladesh. Their tales of atrocities and abuse, a reminder of the warnings that went unheard. 
That was the BBC's Jonah Fisher from Myanmar. The politics of Australia's same-sex marriage debate have made their way into the most sacred of venues, the Australian sporting arena. A planned performance by the US music star Macklemore at the National Rugby League Grand Final in Sydney this weekend, NRL, has sparked protests and political division. The rapper is planning to sing his smash hit Same Love, which advocates equal rights for and treatment of gay people. Anti-same-sex marriage campaigners say there's no place for it on rugby league biggest day. The controversy has seen the hit song rocket back up the charts and inspired the Prime Minister to try his hand at rapping. Here's the ABC's Eliza Borello. You wouldn't be alone if you've had these chords stuck in your head this week. Macklemore's Same Love hasn't had this much airplay since it was released in 2013. When I was in the third grade, I thought that I was gay. It's one of several chart-topping hits the US rappers set to play before Sunday's NRL Grand Final. And it's been on repeat because anti-gay marriage campaigners don't like its pro-same-sex marriage message. And a certificate on paper isn't going to solve it all, but it's a damn good place to start. Former Prime Minister and no campaigner Tony Abbotts complained the performance will politicise the grand final, while independent MP Bob Catter, who's heading to the game to support his beloved North Queensland Cowboys, says it will insult fans. This CEO bloke who made this decision, hey, listen, mate, it's tantamount to seeping sewage into the debutant ball. And you are responsible for it. The NRL's chief executive, Todd Greenberg, has no regrets. I think it's one of the bravest and best decisions we've made for pre-match entertainment. He had the current Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull's support on Channel 10's The Project last night. Tony Abbott saying uh, he you know, obviously doesn't want the performance to happen. Does that make his free speech argument hypocritical? Well, let me put it this way, you know trying to censor the playlist at the halftime entertainment at the grand final uh, is not consistent with taking a you know, liberal approach to free speech. L let, him, let him play the song. It's a, you said it was a hit. But we're not sure this will be a hit. <laughs> <laughs> Waleed, you're the man. You're the Tigers <laughs> fan. Oh! You can talk. The crows can squawk. Oh! During a radio interview in the US, Macklemore revealed the squawking from no campaigners had got his attention. I'm playing Same Love, and they're going through right now trying to legalise same-sex marriage in Australia. So I'm getting a lot of tweets from angry old white dudes in Australia. Oh, wow. Undeterred, the Grammy Award winners expected to make the case for change at a media conference hosted by the NRL later today. Pretty much guaranteeing whether you like it or not, you'll be hearing more of this between now and Sunday. She keeps me warm. She keeps me warm. Eight minutes to six, Eliza Borello from ABC, the reporter there. A plan to build a five-star hotel in Dunedin has hit a brick wall. Tekapur businessman Anthony Toswell has proposed the 17-storey development in Moray Place, which included 210 hotel rooms as well as hospitality and conference facilities. But the Dunedin City Council Hearings Committee declined the bid, saying it failed to meet the required standards needed to gain consent. The panel of independent commissioners that heard the application say it was significantly influenced by the visual impact of the proposed development and the effects of shading on parts of the city. Anthony Toswell told our reporter, Maya Burry, he's very disappointed with the decision. We are at the moment just uh, regathering all the information and going through the very detailed report that they have submitted and issued to the public and ourselves. And we're looking at our options and considerations of where to go, for, how to proceed further thereafter. But at this stage, you're not going to be appealing the decision? We won't be appealing the decision. What we will be doing is reviewing the documentation and the process of the, of the decision. And so that means, you know, potentially you could, um, there might be a, f a future development further down the line that you might make an application for. Is that kind of what you're getting at? or um, More than likely we wouldn't unless we had some further uh, incentive that this wouldn't reoccur again. Uh, we, we're very concerned that, that this has occurred and therefore uh, we feel we've let down both the Dunedin public and we've let down the uh, business uh, fraternity in Dunedin and we're very disappointed that uh, that's happened and so we would need to know that uh, Dunedin is open for investment. 
And so where does this leave the, the chances of this um, hotel development going ahead, I guess? Oh, it doesn't give it uh, much of a chance at all at this stage. The Mayor's made a bit of a comment saying he's disappointed as well. It seems like quite a lot of the community was behind this. We would suggest that 99.99% were. However, commercial interests have been involved and uh, other people have had their say and uh, we have to respect that and we do. And uh, we just need to look at how we can progress forward if there is any possibility to doing so. Anthony Tossel talking to our reporter Maya Barry. We'd love your feedback if you're listening to this in Dunedin, Texas, 2101. A South Taranaki farmer says his son got the surprise of his life to discover a cow which had already given birth to triplets, a highly unusual event, was about to give birth to another. The cow called Becky gave birth to quadruplets, Bonnie, Blossom, Belinda and Bluebell last month. The chances of that event, about 1 in 11 million. Danny Kavanagh told me the new arrivals, who each weighed at about 30 kilos, were completely unexpected. The scan normally picks up twins or anything like that. Yeah. But the scan showed um, nothing um, <laughs> more than one. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so, so you thought that, that, that there was one calf coming out? That's right, yeah. Yeah. And, and were you there or thereabouts for the occasion or did, or did you just find them as you were wandering past? Well, what happened to son Michael, who, um, who um, um, farms in partnership with my wife and myself, um, he checks on the, on the cows calving every night after milking. And she'd already calved one, one was on the ground. And, um, and then he just thought she looked like she was still um, maybe in labour. So he just checked. She's a really quiet cow, so he's standing up in the paddock. So he carved one more, and then he just um, checked again to make sure, you know, everything was all right inside, and he found the third one. And um, <laughs> it was a really cold, wet night. We thought we'd better get the cards out of, out of the cold, you know, um, and we needed some costumes. So we got Becky, the mother, um, into the cow shed. Now she's walking in the cow shed, um, uh, another head popped out. <laughs> so she, it was she, quite was, unbelievable. she was, she yeah. was w wandering along, and number four was peeking out the back. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, it, was, it was amazing. Yeah. Have, have yeah. you have you ever had triplets before, even? Uh, no, we've had um, a couple of sets of twins, but n not triplets even, no, no. And so no. quads, is have you ever heard of anyone? I mean, you, 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 on the grapevine, has anyone had quads before that you've heard of? I've, I've heard of um, uh, an island in Texas, I think it was, there were quads born, and apparently in Taranaki, years ago, there was a set of quads, but the mother died and two or three of the calves died as well, so I think this is the only set that's actually survived. And, and how's how's dear old mum? <laughs> she's good. She's um, oh Becky, she's she's seven year old. She's um, she's very very quiet. She's um, you know, to get her in the shed, you got to give her a pat, and uh, you know, she's she's just one of those um, dear old cows here. But um, no, she's she's just back to normal. Yeah. yeah. She's called Becky, is she? Becky, yes. Yeah. 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 And so you, you you describe her as if she's got a character. So do they have quite distinct personalities? Do they? Oh yes, they do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, she's always she's always last when we get them into milk. She's always last. That's because she's know. looking after four kids, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> she's try, trying to get them off to school or get them to eat their breakfast or something. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, look, I, I, look. This is an awful question to ask because I, I don't know what answer we're going to get here. But what are, are, what's happened to the calves? Um. Well. Because they're all heifers, which is very rare, um, um, in twins and triplets, you might get two heifers and one bull. Um, and and um, in, in, in cattle, if you have um, one bull or one heifer, it normally means that the um, heifer is infertile. They call it a Freemason. Wow. Um, but these are all four, four heifers. So even though they're a little bit smaller, we're going to keep them um, and just see how they grow, you know? Yeah. That's good news, isn't it? I felt real trepidation as I asked that question, Danny Kavanagh. Uh, one in 11 million chance of, um, of uh, having quadruplets uh, when you're carving.
Lots and lots of feedback on health and the DHB. County's Managua tonight, but we've been looking at lots of DHBs, as you know, over the past couple of months. Your exposure, says Richard, of the underfunding of health boards questions the national government's plans for tax cuts for those who can afford health insurance as a priority over providing adequate health care for the population with more modest incomes. Peter from Christchurch says, if this is a caretaker period for the government, then it's been caretaking since 2008. Does that explain its consistent underfunding of health boards? Doug says, read DHBs and the National government wants to give us a tax cut instead of more funding for health. Disgraceful. Hi, John. Asking for voluntary redundancies of people at the top of the pay scale, whatever profession, says Jane, to enable employment of more people assumed to be at the lower end of the pay scale damages the quality of care by reducing the level of wisdom and experience in the care team. And this uh, is a longer one. Wipe out all deficits for DHBs, remove capital investments from DHBs and put this on to ministry. Set up some better system for financing ongoing maintenance of DHBs infrastructure, remove barriers around the toxic relationship between the ministry, minister and DHBs. Acknowledgement by government that this really is their problem. Good luck to whomever has to deal with this dysfunctional system. We really appreciate your feedback. Thank you. Lots of it every time we cover the health system. Uh, it is an issue in which you are actively engaged. RNZ News at 6. Nga mihi nui, good evening. Ko Katrina Bat in Aho. The head of the cash-strapped county's Manukau District Health Board admits there's a risk patient care could be compromised by staff shortages. Gloria Johnson has told Checkpoint the DHB, which runs Middlemore Hospital, urgently needs more staff. But with the projected $20 million deficit this year, it needs to cut costs. She says an internal survey of doctors echoes nurses' concerns about the pressure on staff and patient safety. They still obviously practice as safely as they possibly can, but it's really stressful not only working really hard, but being aware of the fact that that may be having an impact on the quality of the job that you're doing as well. Dr Johnson says the voluntary cessation scheme for staff who want to quit is intended to free up funds to meet growing acute demand. The disaster coordinator of Vanuatu's Ambai Island says most of the island's evacuation will be completed over the weekend. An armada of ferries, trawlers and other boats has headed for Ambai after the government made the call to evacuate the island's 11,000 people from the danger of a volcanic eruption. More than 7,000 people are already crammed into coastal evacuation centres as a thick layer of volcanic ash and acid rain blankets villages and crops. The disaster coordinator Manuel Ure says authorities are hoping to have cleared the whole island by early next week. Few people have already made the final arrangement to travel out from Ambai to their families either in both Pila or Santo or to the other islands. But uh, the provincial arrangement, we are waiting ships to come in and uh, uh, hoping that we, we can evacuate most people probably during the weekend. Manuel Ure says the evacuees will be scattered around the nearby islands of Santo, Pentecost, Malikula and Maiwo. The former Green MP Stephen Browning has dismissed the idea of his party forming a government with National, saying their principles are incompatible. National's deputy Paula Bennett this morning said her party would quite like to talk to the Greens about the possibility of forming a government. The Greens co-leader James Shaw has previously played down the idea, but says he'd have to listen to an offer if the National Party called. But Mr Browning says National's principles are anathema to the Greens. The National Party lied about Labor's fiscal intentions. That is dirty politics. It's got dirty results. National is full of it. The former Green MP Stephen Browning. Recent attacks on vehicles belonging to conservation workers and contractors have left the Department of Conservation fearing for the safety of its staff. In three instances, wheel nuts on the vehicles were loosened, but the department says other threats have also been made. Emery May reports. In the most serious case, a contractor's wheel came off while he was driving after the wheel nuts were loosened. However, Docs Director General Lou Sanson has also seen posts on Facebook threatening to put wires across gullies to bring down helicopters and says several brochures depicting helicopters as targets have been left on the organisation's vehicles. 
He believes there are attempts to intimidate workers involved in 1080 pest control operations and says while people have a right to legitimate protest, when it crosses the line in that way, it is going too far. Mr Sampson is urging anyone who sees people tampering with dock vehicles to contact the police. This is Anne-Marie May. A developer whose bid to build a five-star inner-city hotel in Dunedin was declined says he won't be appealing the ruling. The Dunedin City Council Hearings Committee released its decision today following public hearings in July. Tikapur businessman Anthony Toswell proposed the 17-storey development in Moray Place, which included 210 hotel rooms as well as hospitality and conference facilities. The independent commissioners noted the visual impact of the proposed development, how it would shade parts of the city centre and its impact on neighbouring heritage buildings. Mr Toswell says he's very disappointed the application was rejected as he felt there'd been an overwhelming support in the city for the development. The next America's Cup will be sailed in 75-foot monoholes off Auckland's North Shore. Along with more details of the Cup defence, Team New Zealand has also given the Auckland Council and the Government a gentle nudge. It's named an Italian venue as a backup should the city be unable to host the regatta. Our America's Cup reporter Todd Nile has details. Team New Zealand's Grant Dalton insists the backup venue is not a prod for Auckland to get on and decide where on the waterfront teams will be based. Government and council officials say they're confident that building can be underway by the team's August 2018 deadline. At least three sailors from each team must be citizens of the home country and others must meet residency rules. Around eight challenges are hoped for, with entries open in January and the boat design finalised by March. In Auckland, Todd Nile. It is five and a half past six. Sport defending champion Lydia Ko is just outside the top ten, nearing the end of the second round of the New Zealand Women's Golf Open in Auckland. Ko is currently tied for 13th, eight shots behind leader Belen Mothal of Spain, whose round today included a hole-in-one. The Crusaders' fullback David Harvili will release a boyhood dream this weekend when he makes his All Blacks debut from the bench in Argentina and he's struggling to contain his excitement. Harvili was brought into the side prior to the first week of the competition to replace the injured Geordie Barrett but has not appeared in any match day squad since. He says he's ready for the cauldron of Test Rugby. Pretty pumped day, like it's been a massive dream of mine to, to get into this team and um, since I was a little kid so it's going to be a huge honour. Trying to stay calm and um, wait for those butterflies to, to go away but um, once I get on there it's just hopefully going to be smooth sailing. David Haveli. Meanwhile, the former Highlanders coach and current Japan national coach, Jamie Joseph, will take control of the Sunwolves super rugby side in Japan. And former All Black Brad Thorne is expected to take over as Queensland Reds coach after the side reportedly sacked Nick Styles. Skipper Winston Reid returns from injury to lead the All Whites in their friendly against Japan in Nagoya next week. The game is part of their preparation for the World Cup Intercontinental Playoff Series in November. Striker Shane Smeltz and midfielder Marco Rojas also return from injury. That's the news. Tomorrow morning, astrophysicist Dr Natalie Battaglia, who is scoping our future as a space-bearing species. Journalist Diana Wichtel tells the story of her father, a Holocaust survivor, and Chef Al Brown reinvents the past. Curried eggs. Yes, tomorrow morning from 8 on RNZ National. Met service weather through to midnight tomorrow, Northland. Occasional rain, easing to a few showers tomorrow morning. Auckland to Taranaki, including Coromandel Peninsula, Bay of Plenty and the Central High Country. Cloudy periods with the odd shower, becoming fine tomorrow morning, but a few showers from afternoon, possibly heavy. Whanganui to Wellington, scattered showers, possibly heavy tomorrow afternoon, but Wellington City staying mostly dry. Gisborne to Hawke's Bay, also Nelson and Marlborough, cloudy periods, a few showers from tomorrow tomorrow afternoon, possibly heavy and thundery about the ranges. Canterbury, Otago and Southland, cloudy periods, a few showers about Otago and Southland, some possibly heavy, easing tonight, showers returning most places tomorrow afternoon, some possibly heavy. Bullo to Fiordland, a few showers, turning to rain in Fiordland and southern Westland tomorrow morning and for the Chatham Islands, periods of rain. It's eight past six and you're listening to Checkpoint. What was Auckland? Pretty... 
Just Cloudy periods, the odd shower. They're coming fine tomorrow morning. It hasn't rained for two or three days. <laughs> yeah, two, it's, it's shocking, <laughs> it's isn't it? It's practically a drought yeah. by Auckland standards. We won't know what to do with ourselves unless it rains soon. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks, Katrina. Have a lovely weekend. You too. Thank you. Eight and a half past six, an armada of ferries, trawlers and other boats is chugging towards the Vanuatu island of Umbayas. The country continues to evacuate about 5% of its population. The decision to clear the island, about 11,000 people, was made yesterday as the island's volcano continues to erupt. But, more problematically, seems to be building towards a much bigger one. Jamie Tahana reports. <laughs> More than 7,000 people are already crammed into coastal evacuation centres nearly two weeks after the volcano, Manara Vui, started belching ash, smoke and occasional bursts of lava. The General Secretary of the Panama Provincial Government, George Wingarai, says locals are used to the volcano, one of the world's most active, but he's never seen anything like this before, even when compared to the last big eruption in 2005. It's much worse than 2005 because the eruption is continuous. Uh, it sometimes stops, but when it starts, it is continuous and, uh, and, and also we are experiencing the uh, more asphalt. The volcano has blanketed most of the island in ash, contaminating an already fragile water supply, choking crops and food gardens, as well as forcing people to flee towards the coast. They've been packed into schools and community halls, running short of food and water, and in conditions far from sanitary. But with Manara Vui rumbling above and showing no signs of abating, the government yesterday made the decision to evacuate the whole island, 11,000 people. Mr Garai says people are devastated. It is very devastating, it is very sad. Uh, the information that was going out yesterday, you know, notifying people of the move, and people were crying, some people were crying. But then the understanding is that safety comes first. The disaster coordinator on Ambai, Manuel Ure, says ferries, trawlers and other vessels are making their way to Ambai to help with the evacuation. Children, the elderly and the disabled will be first when evacuations start on Saturday and Mr Ure says he hopes all 11,000 people will be gone by the middle of next week. Few people have already made the final arrangement to travel out from Ambai to their families either in both Pila or Santo or to the other islands. But uh, the provincial arrangement, we are waiting ships to come in and uh, uh, hoping that we, we can evacuate most people probably during the weekend. The evacuees will be scattered around the nearby islands of Santo, Pentecost, Malakula and Maiwo, where the government is opening its land and some custom chiefs have offered theirs. A leader in the Malbanban area of southern Pentecost, Robinson Tema, says his chiefs have made the decision to accept about 500 evacuees. He says villagers are clearing out nakamals and churches, readying for their arrival. The area that I'm living in, there are lots of rivers. Maybe with food, we need help from the government to support us with uh, food to feed the people who will be coming from Mumbai. Robinson Tema says he doesn't know how long the people will be staying. No one does, just as no one knows whether a major volcanic eruption will occur on Mumbai. This is Jamie Tahana. Thanks so much, Jamie. Uh, we asked for feedback just before the news on this hotel in Dunedin that is not going ahead, and by golly, we've got it. Thank you. With thousands of possible hotel designs, why pursue one that was bound to fail, one that looked like a squatting transformer, one with no gesture towards sustainability? At least 25% uh, were opposed, as were most submissions, says Richard. The hotel was a bad design and unsuitable for the site, trying for the cheapest construction. Design would have been better if it terraced up the site instead of a tower dominating the town hall, cathedral and octagon, says another Dunedin resident. Leanne says... The hotel was very controversial. There was significant opposition to it. It was proposed by someone who had no history of our city nor any understanding of Dunedin's history. Not only, when the, not only were there issues around shading and creating a wind tunnel, it completely ignored all the existing building restrictions in the city. Dunedin is a city that relies heavily on its heritage and this, this monstrosity would have destroyed it. These are men coming to our city telling us to be sheep that are uh, doing as the likes of Auckland does is our best and only option. We need people to understand and respect the city's history to find an innovative option.
Hey, Steph here from Dunedin. Hey, Steph. The proposed hotel was a monstrosity. It was ugly and sensitive to the unique architectural style of the city and was certainly not supported by 99% of locals. What Dunedin wants is a long, sprawling waterfront hotel that will link the waiting to be, waiting to be developed industrial waterfront area to the city via the historic railway station. Smiley face, smiley face. Thank you, Steph. Judging from letters and submissions read the proposed hotel, 99% were opposed to it. It would be at least half apartments with some hotel rooms massively dominating all other buildings, shading the octagon. A bulky, ugly, chase-style 80s building, Philippa. Um, chase style, gosh, that takes me back. Thank you so much for your feedback. We really appreciate hearing from you. And as you can hear, um, overwhelmingly, the people who've been in touch say they didn't want that hotel. 40 minutes past six in a matter of theories. Oh, no, I've done that. Go, John. It's Friday night, though. With thousands of possible hotel designs. No, that's feedback. Might just have... <laughs> I just, perhaps just said in my office, my God, you're on air. Europe's largest airline, Ryanair, has been whacked by the UK aviation regulator like I was just whacked by Pip and has been given 24 hours to sort out compensation for hundreds of thousands of passengers affected by mass flight cancellations. Earlier this month, Ryanair announced it was cancelling tens of thousands of flights for the coming winter season in Europe, blaming a problem with pilot rostering and staff. Yesterday, it announced even more, along with some route suspensions affecting up to 400,000 passengers. Serious numbers. The BBC's Richard Westcott has the latest. It's Europe's biggest and busiest airline. But Ryanair's been made to look a bit small today. Accused of persistently misleading nearly three quarters of a million customers, the UK regulator has now threatened them with legal action. We want them to make it crystal clear to every single passenger what that passenger is entitled to in terms of rerouting expenses and compensation where that's applicable. We don't think that's a big task. It's, the law is very, very clear. There's no dispute on the law. It's just about Ryanair's willingness to do that. The regulator says airlines are meant to rebook passengers on rival carriers if they can't replace their cancelled flight. But just listen to Ryanair's boss last week. We will not be paying for flights on other airlines, no. It's not part of the EU 261 uh, entitlements, and as the lowest cost, we are being the lowest cost airline in Europe, we can't afford to pay the high fares of our competitors. There are lots of confused customers like Matthew, who, in an online chat with the airline, told them, you are obligated to reroute me, as advised in the CAA's open letter. Ryanair replied, no, I'm not. Duncan says they refused to book me on another flight except for the next Ryanair one on Wednesday, which was three days later. Kevin says nowhere did they say they could book us onto flights with another airline. The CAA has written to Ryanair again tonight, setting out a series of deadlines. By 5pm tomorrow, they must put more information on the website about how people can reroute flights and claim back expenses. They've been told to then email passengers about their rights by the middle of next week. It's pretty rare for you to go public like this. You must be angry. Uh, we are furious. We simply don't understand why this needs to drag on for weeks and why at the end of this process, customers are, still can't be clear uh, about what their entitlements are when Ryanair cancel hundreds of thousands of journeys. If the CAA takes further action, it could land Ryanair with a multi-million pound fine but the airline says it will comply with the regulator and it's issued guidance to call centre staff. Yesterday, Ryanair suspended 34 winter routes, including five in Scotland, where the First Minister has stepped in. I have serious concerns about the decisions taken by Ryanair in the last couple of days. These will cause disruption to many passengers travelling to and from uh, Scotland to London and indeed uh, to other destinations across uh, Europe and passengers were concerned too. 13 of us had to hire a minibus and go to Newcastle. The other three went to Liverpool, had to drive to Liverpool and then get a flight across to Barcelona. It's just, yeah, Ryanair, I mean, <laughs> should have learned our lesson and not booked with them. <laughs> There's a global shortage of pilots right now. Plenty of rivals are recruiting. Ryanair didn't have enough crews to cover the holidays. After cancelling 20,000 flights out of the blue, it's promising no more problems ahead. 
Richard Westcott with an inexplicable piece of music by Phoenix, that French pop band underneath, right? Weird. Loud, raucous parties might spring to mind as triggering a noise complaint, but a flying fox, one Christchurch community, is crying foul over a proposal to remove its squeaky piece of play equipment, which has generated complaints from neighbours and defied the council's attempts to tone it down. Our delightful reporter, Conan Young, went to have a look. The moving part of the flying fox in Preston's was removed just a few months after it was built last year, following complaints from those living within about 20 metres of it. The council has spent just over a year trialling new mechanisms, but to no avail. The ward councillor, David East, says the community board will vote on Monday on a staff recommendation to rip out the flying fox completely. Acoustic results seem to be just under or just over allowable levels in daylight hours, but do not in any way meet the nighttime hours. David East says another issue is the mound the flying fox sits on, which means people can see into nearby homes. We're talking a very narrow reserve here, and this mound, when you're sitting on top of it, you're actually looking right down into the living and bedroom areas of a couple of adjacent houses. None of the residents living closest to the playground were home when RNZ came calling today. But Jesse Davison, who lives about 50 metres away and has two young children, wants the flying fox to stay. It is definitely a noisy flying fox. It didn't bother us, but I know there are quieter alternatives out there, so it'd be nice to think we could come to some kind of compromise with a quieter flying fox. She doesn't think the mound is an intrusion of privacy. Absolutely not. I'm, I'm really surprised. Um, I guess it's a new subdivision, so with a bit of planting and some time, I'm sure that wouldn't be too much of an issue. Another resident who asked not to be named says most locals want the flying fox to remain. We're all disappointed to see it going. We can um, empathise with the people who are really close to it, um, and that's unfortunate, but I suppose when you buy near a park, you're near a park. He says it's important for residents of a new subdivision to have a common recreational place. While we don't use it a lot, our grandkids do when they come, uh, we get a huge amount of pleasure watching people coming and going. Little groups of kids, parents and kids, all of those, scooting, skateboarding, riding bikes up and down to there. It is a place where they go. This resident, who also asked not to be named, said without the flying fox, the playground wouldn't have much to entertain older children and noted the next closest playground was a long way away. I hope that, you know, it gets resolved in favour of keeping it, of course, and maybe locked up at night. But we And I know the neighbours next door, um, they've got two littlies and they're very stressed about it. Monday's community board vote will be on whether to permanently remove the flying fox with an option of directing staff to investigate finding a new home at another park. In Ōtōtahi for Checkpoint, Ko Konan Young Tene. This is a bit of a treat for me, this interview. It doesn't really go anywhere, it just meanders gorgeously. The fishing season officially kicks off this weekend with thousands of anglers heading out onto lakes, rivers and streams to try their luck. Now, unfortunately, Walter Keenan won't be among them. He's recently had a heart attack and he's still on the road to recovery. Go, Walter. But the 90-year-old has more memories than most. He's been fishing our lakes and rivers for the past 68 seasons and he told me the key to being a good angler was to outsmart that fish. I've, I've enjoyed enjoyed my fishing life extremely well. I, I, I took my first licence out in 19, 1950, and uh, I haven't haven't missed one ever since. So uh, it's been a, been a been a wonderful wonderful uh, episode. I don't mind telling you. Yeah, it's a, it's um it's something that you every time you go out you learn something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Fishing is a grand, a grand um, occupation. I tell you, it is. A lot of, a lot of people, a lot of people don't realise exactly how much pleasure you get out of it. Yeah, and of course, you're out in the, out in the sunshine too, and the, the fresh air, and everything's in your, in your favour. You know, it's up to you to do what you have to do. <laughs> <laughs> Outsmart the fish. Um, I um, time your own flies, and yeah. they're inclined to like them. Yeah. That they're inclined to like them too. So. Yeah, it sort of helps. It must be really rewarding when you tie your own flies and, and get them, Walter. That must make it feel a bit special. Oh, it, it does. Um, when you tie one out of your head, I, I only tie all my flies out of my head. They're not to any pattern. And um, uh, I go stalking 
I, I can't I can't uh, fish the the lakes and rivers like I used to on the bank walking. I, I've had a knee a knee replacement too, of course. And anyway, uh, w what you do though, you stalk on on a calm morning. You put your if you see your fish, if you see your fish 30, 30 yards away, put your fly out on the bottom ready, and can conceal yourself. Don't wear a, a, a yellow hat or a white hat or anything. You, you blend in with the background. And when he gets about three feet from the fly, just give it a wee twitch and watch him pick it up. And boy, oh boy, the, the game's on then. <laughs> yeah, by Jove. The amount of times I've done that. <laughs> the amount of times I've done that. All sizes of fish. All sizes. Up, up to 13 pounds. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Beautiful. What's it like bringing a 13-pounder in, Walter? That must be a magic thing. I'll tell you what. Um, my old mate I used to fish with, actually, I'm the last of the six, six of us. Um, he, if I got six fish, he'd get five. If, if I got five, he'd get four. I could always somehow get one ahead <laughs> of him, and he didn't seem to like it, you know. <laughs> anyway, this particular night, Two of us, two of us went round to the to the hole. Uh, uh, Joe and Noel went round to the hole. Alan and I went round to the big rock, and we were at the big, big high rocky area. Anyway, um, after about three quarters of an hour, Alan got a bit cheesed. Daughter was pretty dead. She said, "Here, I'll go round to the hole and fish for the boys." I said, "Right, out." Well, the time he got halfway around, I had three on the bank. And anyway, uh, a bit later on, the, the the light was starting to fade a wee bit. And I, was, I fished a little homemade red setter on a number 10 hook, a little wee small one, and um, I cast it out. Let it sink. Give it a couple of weaves, and I snagged it, as I thought. But the snag started to move. Next thing, the fish is on, and he go, he's going out. Anyway, in the half light of this time, he, he came out of the water about 70 or 80 yards out, I saw the big silhouette. I said, you, what have I got here? Three quarters of an hour later, I got it into the bank because I was only fishing a four and a half pound cast. <coughs> and I got the net under him, put the rod down, lifted it out, put it on the scales, and he was 13 pounds. Ooh. 13 pound hen brown fish. <laughs> a beautiful fish. You ought to see it. Yeah, oh, magic. Anyway, the old mate, now this time too, things were getting a bit dead again. So I thought, right, back to the tent, make a cup of tea. The old primer stove, and I could hear these three guys coming up the track, the dead calm. And me mate, I, I heard old Joe say, I wonder what that bee's got to beat me tonight. <laughs> anyway, in, in they came to the tent. How'd you go, lads? Good old Joe said, little bag of six, Walt. Very good. I shook him by the hand. He said, how'd you go? Oh, I said, not bad. I said, I got these three. I said, and, and this one out here. I shone the torch on him, on him, 13 pounder. He said, I knew there'd be something to beat me. He said, <laughs> he, he did his bun. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was all part of the, part of the life. <laughs> yeah, that, that was old Joe. Oh, had lot, lots of experiences. Years and years down at Lake Heron. Oh, boy. You know, Walter. You know Lake Heron at all? Yeah, it's beautiful. It's yeah, yeah. It's and Lake Coleridge. In the area. Yeah, yeah, I know. And Lake Coleridge is beautiful. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's beautiful around there. You know what, oh, Walter? Oh, when, when you yeah. when you oh, talk, it's Lake Coleridge. Oh, Coleridge is beautiful, Walter. Yep, yep. Walter, when you talk about it, you become um, like quite poetic. Oh, <laughs> oh, look, I've had that many. That many trips up there years ago. Oh boy, we used to just about live there. <laughs> yeah. It was so it was so good. We fished the fly, of course. We only we used to spin when it got a gale nor'wester. It was six foot waves, you know, and we'd go straight into it. And we used to catch fish too. And now the guys would be in their tents, a bit bent in the elbow, you know. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, they were they were they were marvelous. They were marvelous weekends. Hmm. Walter Keenan, who's been fishing for seven decades and has the fishing licence from every single year to prove it. Just before we go tonight, Football Hall of Famer OJ Simpson, who was granted parole in July after serving nine years of 33-year sentence for armed robbery. 
of course, got off acquitted, not guilty in that very famous case, could be released from a Nevada prison as early as Monday. Linda Sue from Reuters reports. He could be a free man by Monday. The Football Hall of Famer was granted parole back in July for good behavior. He served nine years of a 33-year sentence in a Nevada prison for a 2008 armed robbery. Although his handcuffs will be gone, Simpson will likely remain shackled to a multi-million dollar wrongful death civil suit. The $58 million suit stems from the murders of his ex-wife Nicole Brown and her friend Ron Goldman. The former football movie and TV star became infamous after his acquittal in the 1994 murders. Although he was found not guilty in criminal court, the civil case forced Simpson to sell his sports memorabilia. In 2008, he claimed some of it was stolen and was just trying to get it back when he stormed a Las Vegas hotel room, which ultimately led to his conviction for armed robbery and kidnapping. We don't know what happened there. That was uh, Reuters track, uh, but as you could hear, only the voiceover was there. None of what we call the effects, which is people talking. Um, that will bring Checkpoint to a slightly eccentric end for this evening. Thank you for being with us, and thank you for an enormous amount of feedback, particularly tonight on the DHBs and the financial pressure they are under, and that hotel in Dunedin, which you're overwhelmingly delighted is not coming to the city. We really appreciate hearing from you, and we really appreciate your company night after night here on RNZ every weeknight from 5 till 6.30. We hope you have a fantastic weekend. We hope to be with you again on Monday. RNZ News Headlines at 6.30. The head of County's Monaco District Health Board says voluntary redundancies may be invited from senior doctors because of a projected $20 million budget deficit. An army of ferries, trawlers and other boats is heading for the Vanuatu island of Ambai to rescue people from the island's volcano. Dock is fearing for the safety of conservation workers and contractors after recent attacks on their vehicles. A developer whose bid to build a 17-storey five-star inner-city hotel in Dunedin was declined and will not be appealing the ruling. A suggestion from National's deputy Paula Bennett that National would quite like to talk to the Greens about forming a government has been scoffed at by party members. And Team New Zealand says it's important to restore some of the traditions associated with the America's Cup after today confirming 75